Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Troutman Pepper Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation Podcast, your compass for navigating the complex world of benefits and compensation. I'm Josh Gelfand, a partner in Troutman Pepper's New York office, and today I'm joined by Mike Crumbach, a partner in our Philadelphia office. Mike and I are both partners in the private equity subgroup of Troutman Pepper's Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation Department, and today we're going to be discussing current executive compensation trends and issues in the private equity M&A space. So executive compensation aspects of private equity M&A cover employment contracts, severance, equity compensation, uh, all in the context of M&A transactions and beyond. So I think we could use that as a jumping point. Uh, Mike, what are some of the aspects and things of note that you've been seeing in your practice lately? Sure. And thanks, Josh. And first of all, my disappointment, I thought I was being invited on the New Heights podcast with the Kelsey brothers. So <laughs> I'm not talking about Taylor Swift and Travis. I, I think we're going to lose uh, two audience members and my daughter. But well, there you go. To dive into this, I think one of the things that are at the forefront of what we always address um, at the outset of any transaction is equity incentives. And in particular, I'm curious what you're seeing recently, but how we're negotiating equity incentive pools for management teams and I think everyone has their own insight on what an appropriate pool looks like as a percentage of fully diluted equity. I have my personal opinions. I'm sure you do too as well. And I think all our clients have their perspective and for the audience, so you understand, Josh and I also represent management teams and executives. So we're often on the other side of the table, so to speak. And we can, we sort of see it from both angles. And I think the first thing, again, going back to the pool is negotiating that percentage. And I guess my personal perspective, eight to 12% of fully diluted equity is sort of a, a starting range. I think it might be helpful. Maybe this is overly basic, but even to just explain or say, when we talk about an equity pool, what it is we're referring to for folks in the call? I think a lot probably do, but some might not. So when we say equity pool, you know, I think what Mike and I are discussing is the portion of the stock or partnership interest, whatever it might be, that would go to members of the management team and other employees typically. And so you reserve that amount to issue to them for when a future sale transaction comes up, right? So the pool being whatever the value, the percentage of value of the company that would go to to the management team. Right. And, and thanks for that clarification, Josh. And that's right. And I think that obviously management is going to want to negotiate for the largest pool possible. Those pools can be influenced by industry as well. So you may have a different market perspective depending on whether you're representing a, a manufacturing company or you're in the health sciences space. But the idea is to, at the outset of a transaction, determine what the intended percentage of overall ownership should be allocated towards management. And again, that 8 to 12% generally applies, I think, for most of our private equity sponsors. I'm curious what you've seen, Josh. I was on a transaction recently where a management council was very hot, not just on negotiating the size of the pool, but negotiating how much of the pool would be allocated to existing management immediately following the transaction. So for instance, I think in this case, it was a 12% equity pool, and they wanted no less than 11% of the pool allocated immediately leaving very little room for, for new hires or promotions and things like that. So it's something that, that was the first time I've seen where a management team was negotiating that specific point. I was curious if you've ever seen that before. That's interesting. No, I, I can't say I've seen that before. I've definitely seen where there's been a discussion where the management team wants clarity on what portion of the pool will be allocated up front. And oftentimes, you know, they'll want some larger portion, but they'll also... Usually, you know, because they're putting on two different hats, right? They have to put on the management hat for themselves, but also like the company hat and say, well, we need to reserve enough that we can bring in new people and, you know, backfill positions that need to be filled. So I haven't seen them push on that point, but I've certainly seen discussions around, you know, oftentimes with the CEO, you know, how much of the pool will be issued up front and how much might be held back for, for dry powder. Right. It's a weird dynamic because, again, wearing those two hats, I think that it does put pressure on management, potentially handcuffing them going forward. Maybe a good time to talk about when we talk about the pool, what does that pool mean in terms of what the actual instrument of incentive equity is? 
when we're dealing with corporations, of course, it's typically stock options or restricted stock. Unusually, it would be RSUs. Those are more public company oriented types of grants. I think Josh will agree that we're oftentimes helping set up structures that are that are partnerships or pass through inst- entities. And more often than not, these days, we're drafting and implementing profits interests. Yeah, I agree. And I think actually one of the things tying in with the pool that I find comes up more often with, let's say, profits interests than stock options, which I think is probably the most common type of equity instrument for a corporation that's set up, right, is the question of when we talk about the pool, what happens to the unallocated portion of the pool? So oftentimes with a corporation structure, right, you've got some authorized percentage or authorized number of shares you issue out of that pool and whatever is unissued is just, you know, not shares in the company. And so it's unallocated, which effectively means that it goes back to the other owners and it doesn't dilute everyone. Whereas, you know, sometimes when you've got a profits interest structure with partnership interest, it's not always so defined, it can be, but it's not always so defined what a specific equity pool is. And so there's maybe not necessarily a cap always on how much can be issued and it's just kind of continued dilution and there's more flexibility there. At least that's what I've seen. And going back to that deal I mentioned, not only did they negotiate for how much of the pool would be used up at the outset. They also negotiated what would happen at an exit event to the extent that any part of that pool was unallocated. And they wanted to ensure that it was, in this case, they negotiated for the CEO to have discretion to allocate the remainder of that pool. And I found that to be kind of an interesting take when you're dealing with profits interests. Profits interests economically have, or at least by definition, have no value at the grant date. So if you're at an exit event and you have to peg a threshold amount in order to keep it as a profits interest and attribute no value to it, you would have to take into account the implications of the transaction and, and its value at that time. So if you're going to allocate the balance of this unused pool and you're using profits interest, those profits interest would have either no value or very little value. Yeah, or effectively you'd just be giving them cash or compensation at ordinary income rates, right? Because you say, I'm going to give you the value of the pool in in some other form. But yeah, it's interesting that you said, I've seen that kind of, I think it's a difference in philosophy between, let's say the management perspective versus the company perspective, which is to say, I've seen situations where the management team will argue, well, hold up a second. You know, the pool is the economics that you want to share with the team. If it turns out that the team that we have can get done the job that you need to get done without bringing in additional people and giving them another share of the pie. Well, we, the team, should get the benefit of that value and we should keep whatever the full value is as opposed to the company perspective being, well, no, we're incentivizing management individuals on a person-by-person basis and what we think is fair and appropriate for that person. And anything that else, it's not like that there's some magic pool that guaranteed to go to everyone and it's just what it, we pay people on an individual basis, what we think is appropriate and fair. So I think that there's that, that's the kind of the differentiation between the two sides. And, you know, who wins is, you know, that's a deal by deal basis and it depends on the facts on the ground, I think. But I think that's kind of the fundamental difference kind of going to what you were saying about, well, if there's unallocated interest, how do we deal with that? Are we saying we're going to pay that to other people or find something? Or is that just, you know, additional saved expenses on the company's part? Exactly. And to your point about it really is supposed to be a person by person evaluation. And it's not just this fixed pool that should be allocated. But this idea that if you are going to go that route and sort of make up for this unused pool that at least theoretically doesn't have any value, you start trending into the sort of full value cash award or phantom equity type of arrangement. And I think what I'm seeing quite a bit of, especially to your point about management turnover, are the sort of complementary profits interest or stock option coupled with a, a phantom interest. Are you seeing a lot of sort of phantom type of arrangements in your practice? Well, that's interesting. So are you seeing, meaning that they, so with a profits interest, like we were talking about just for the, for the sake of the audience, by a profits interest, one of the requirements to satisfy the tax requirements of it is that it has to be granted with a threshold value 
like a value that's a liquidation value of zero on the date of grant, meaning that if the company were sold, you'd get no value on the date of grant. Think of it like the exercise price of, of a stock option. And so I think sometimes, and let me know if this is what, what you're, you're seeing, sometimes you know, people will say, well, hold up a second, you know, there's value today. I, want, I don't want to give up on that value. So grant me some sort of a compensatory bonus arrangement tying in with that profits interest so that I don't lose out on the accretion to date of grant. And then I'll get both of those things on a transaction. Is that what you're seeing or am I misconstruing it? Yes. Not just in that circumstance. I think there's a number of different circumstances where phantom equity comes into play. It could be something <laughs> simple as a mistake. We promised Josh when he joined the company a year ago that we were going to give him profits, interest, or stock options. And guess what? We forgot. And now we're on the cusp of exiting and we want to make it up to Josh. If we're going to grant a stock option or a profits interest, as Josh noted, those have sort of exercise prices that render them valueless when you take into account the value of the transaction. So there's really no value to, to gain there or appreciate between the grant and the exit when the exit is on your doorstep. For phantom equity, it comes in to be relatively useful in that it doesn't have the attributes of actual equity. So it's not going to have any preferable tax advantage. It's not going to be subject to long-term capital gain. It's going to be treated like a bonus subject to ordinary income tax recognition and then withholding, but it gives you the flexibility of making up for that lost grant and providing whatever economics you think are appropriate in the context of the individual and the, and the transaction. And I think I'm seeing quite a bit of that, not just because of the mistake and mistakes come up quite a bit where our clients are <laughs> unfortunately forgetting to do things. And maybe to the audience and to the extent that you're sitting in a seat where you're responsible for equity grants, maybe this is the point where we say, be careful what you put in offer letters. If you say you're going to make a grant to somebody in an offer letter or an employment contract, make sure you do it and do it timely. Yeah, no, I agree. So to, I think to answer your question, yes, I'm seeing it. And I think that sometimes it's also, it obviously comes with a lot of baggage around structuring to be either compliant or exempt from Section 409A of the tax code, which governs deferred compensation arrangements. And it could probably be its own podcast uh, you know, in and of itself. So I don't think we can delve entirely into that here. But I think oftentimes I, I do see phantom arrangements either going hand in hand, like you said, with profits, interests, or, or, or just being granted. I actually have one matter I'm working on right now where it wasn't profits, interest, it's actually stock, but stock was issued. And it has, you know, it, it's it's restricted stock, and they realized that they forgot to make an 83B election, and at this point, it's too late. An 83B election, for those who don't know, is is an election to allow you to pay the tax on the value of the restricted stock on the date of grant, as opposed to the date when it vests, which absent an 83B election would be the date on which the taxable event occurs. So you get the benefit of taking, hopefully a lesser amount into income, although you bear the risk that down the road, if it doesn't come to have a, a good value, you've paid tax on cash or value you've never actually received. But so they, they've missed the 83B election deadline and now vesting is, is, is quickly approaching or will soon be approaching. And we're, they're trying to figure out a way to mitigate the downside and avoid that tax hit. And one possible solution, and without getting too much into, into the, the nitty gritty of it, but one possible solution is to switch this in a 409A compliant way, but to switch it into a deferred compensation phantom award to allow you to push out the taxable event until a sale transaction. Now, like you said, the cost of that, one of the costs, is you get ordinary income taxation on the transit on the, on the sale as opposed to potentially capital gains tax, which is typically lower, but it might be worth it in their situation to avoid the tax it. So I think I do see that coming up more and more. And that's interesting. And where the 83B election is, is particularly relevant is where the incentive equity has vesting conditions. But maybe this is a good time to segue into maybe what we're seeing in, in terms of vesting conditions that our clients want, vesting conditions that management council are negotiating for. And I think one of the things that I'm noticing quite a bit is the trend over the last several years to a split between both time and performance vesting. Time being just 
if you stay for a certain period of time with the company, you will vest. Whereas performance vesting is oftentimes, especially when we're representing a, a private equity backed entity, the it's based on the exit value at the time of of a transaction and their multiple of return on the sponsor's equity. And I think before this sort of trend towards more performance vesting, it was, at least in my experience, was almost always just pure time-based vesting. Now with the introduction of performance, you get into oftentimes the negotiation between, well, what's the split? Should it be 50-50 time to performance? Is it 60-40, 40-60? Josh, what are you seeing in, in your practice? Yeah, I agree with all that. I think that, like you said, the trend that I've seen now, for obvious reasons, is a split of both time and performance vesting conditions. And, you know, it's interesting. So one thing that, to note is when we talk about time versus performance, time vesting conditions means if you're in your seat or, or whatever it might be, you get it. Performance is both not just performance, but also service vesting. So you still have to be in your seat, but you also have to hit the metric for that. And I agree. I think there's, I've seen negotiations around what that mix is going to be of which, you know, I think 50-50 or 60-40, 70-30, anything like that. And then I think there's also, you know, variance on what the performance metrics are. I think you hit on the main ones, right? There's oftentimes it's the multiple of invested capital, like a return on investment. And then also oftentimes that's paired with an internal rate of return hurdle, which essentially the way people can think about it is the multiple of invested capital says, how much money did I make? And the IRR return essentially says, how quickly did I achieve that goal, right? Because it's an internal rate of return. And the faster you go to a transaction, right? If you've, if you've reached the same multiple, the higher the rate of return, the internal rate of return will be because to get to that level, you've had to have hit a per higher percentage. So I've seen, you know, negotiation around whether you've got both an IRR and a, a multiple of invested capital, maybe on some piece, it's one and not the other. And I think there's a variance there. And I think another place that I'm curious to hear your thoughts that I've seen a lot of negotiation and discussion is also really how you calculate that return amount, right? Because oftentimes it's a debate of like, you know, is it a cash on cash return? Meaning is it just cash in and cash out? Or do you factor in other types of property and consideration like deferred consideration or marketable or non-marketable securities and how that all plays in? Because often from the PE sponsor side, in my experience, there's very much a focus on cash and cash equivalents because they've got to, at the end of the day, respond to it and provide a return to their investors. And so for their perspective, what matters is what they receive back and can actually distribute out. And so there's oftentimes a focus on ensuring cash on cash return. Whereas if you are on, on the management side, they'll say, well, that's not, you know, if there's an exit, there's an exit. And we have to figure out some way to determine performance based on other things you might get. Like if it was a, you know, maybe part of the consideration is in the form of shares of the acquirer or of the buyer or something to that effect. So I'm not sure if you've seen a lot of negotiation on that point or what you've been seeing in the market. <laughs> a ton. Ed. Mike is laughing for those who can't see on the, because this is an audio podcast. So the multiple as a multiple of return on the investment, that's so wide ranging in my experience. And I feel like our private equity clients and other private equity firms that I've been on the other side of the table from, they're very much stuck to what they think the rate multiple is. And it usually ranges between two and 4%. Recently, I, I had a management engagement where it was 5%. It was staggered between three and five, but still I thought a 5X return was extraordinary. I kind of feel like if you're looking at market, it's, it's around three maybe between two and a half and four, something like that is, is something that I would ordinarily consider market and reasonable. Get to five, I'm going to probably start having a little bit of heartburn if I'm representing management. But it's really an interesting discussion when we're talking about the calculation of the return. And to your point, Josh, is it, more often than not, it is cash in, cash out. Sometimes sponsors and management teams get comfortable that Okay, we'll include marketable securities. 
but I rarely see non-marketable securities be included in the calculation of return. The other thing that often comes into play is management fees. Many of our private equity entities that we represent are getting a management fee. And should that or should that not be in included as part of their return, I would argue that it shouldn't. It's just a fee. It's not a return on investment. And a transaction I was involved in several months ago, management was really barking at this point and really thought that that maybe because the fee was potentially higher than a typical management fee. But nonetheless, they did not win that point for one. But I did have another circumstance where management did get the private equity firm to agree the management fees would be included up to a point. In that case, it was some number of hundreds of thousands would be taken into account, but nothing over that. So it's really interesting and all the different law firms have their views and different counselors have their views as to how returns should be determined. It can be complicated. And I think oftentimes us lawyers, we sort of buried in the negotiation and the drafting. And we oftentimes get to the end of a, of a transaction and we're looking at the English on the page and we we go to model it out on the next Excel spreadsheet. We're like, what the heck was, were we thinking? <laughs> How exactly is this supposed to work? You know, and I think to that point, one of the things is that you sometimes see, you know, proceeds definition that, that takes into account the proceeds that are deliverable in respect of incentive equity. So that creates a circular calculation to determine exactly what the vesting should be in that circumstance. I don't know if you want to talk about that when I think about the termination aspects that are sort of part of that determination. That's another area where we spend a lot of energy negotiating. So to tack on to what you were saying before, because I think it's very accurate, you know, I think there's a range of what we might or other practitioners might view as what's market. But at the end of the day, it really is offered. It's just a case by case. Everything is bespoke to whatever the particular transaction is. And so there might be a range of you know the equity pool or how the vesting works, but everything really comes down to what the particular situation is for that particular arrangement. Because you know you might have a fund that you know presented to its investors that this is how you know this is the return it's going to make, and that's what drives whatever the return might be. And it, it, it's all really at the end of the day. Well, you know every situation is unique, I think, and so that, you know that's that's got to be taken into account whether you're on the management side or or the company side. I think on that piece of it which I think is very helpful. And that's a great point. A lot of these things are negotiable. I do think that we have, rightly so, clients that have certain models that they know work for them. And they're not going to be particularly interested in negotiating certain items like the return multiple or vesting conditions. I think your experience is probably like mine. We spend a ton of energy negotiating what the consequences of a separation are. And when it's time vesting equity, pretty simple. It can, it can simply be you got what you earned through your termination date as the recipient. It can be maybe we'll fully accelerate your time-based equity incentives. I think that's pretty rare. Sometimes it's somewhere in between. We'll give you one year's worth of credit towards your time vesting criteria. Where it gets very complicated, I think, is where we're talking about what the consequence of a separation is to a manager's performance-based equity. And I'm interested to see what you negotiate for and what your clients are more or less willing to agree to. But ordinary case, since your point earlier, performance-based vesting almost always is tied to the recipient's continued service through the exit event, liquidity event. If you leave beforehand, you're, you're out of luck that equity goes away, that performance-based equity goes away. You can keep your vested, but performance, nothing's going to be payable in respect to those units or, or shares. I do sometimes see, though, you know, depending on the circumstances and the situation, sponsors might be willing to consider doing what I would call a post-termination tail eligibility on the performance hurdle, which is essentially to say that you know, if there's a good lever termination situation, then they would consider, they would allow the performance vesting award to hang out there for some period of time so that if a transaction occurs during that tail period 
you know, there it remains eligible to vest. And often the theory behind that being that if the person is a good lever and a deal happens relatively soon after they leave, they were probably involved with it or they should get the benefit to some extent of that transaction. And so I've seen, you know, again, depending on the situation, I've seen that negotiated where, where sponsors are, are comfortable with that. I've seen situations where sponsors are, are not comfortable with that. But that's on the performance side, which I have seen. Yeah, an SEL period is anywhere from usually three to 12 months. I think six months is probably one of those areas where most people can be comfortable that if the manager is leaving within six months of a transaction, they probably were involved to some extent and certainly were hopefully instrumental in driving the success of the business that's being sold. So I think we can get comfortable with some tail period. One of the things I saw recently was a no tail period, but the company would run sort of a pro forma evaluation. And had they exited on the separation date, what would have been vested in, in terms of performance? which I thought was unique, probably not easy to do. Again, it's one of those situations where you're, you're drafting it and putting it in English, but when you have to actually run that calculation, it's just probably not the cleanest calculation that you have to make. Yeah, that's the tricky one, I would say. <laughs> I think another place that that ties into actually is on repurchase rights, so call rights. Oftentimes when a service provider terminates employment, right, the, the company will have a repurchase right on the vested equity, the unvested profits interest, let's say we're talking about that, or shares, but stock, the unvested award will, will be forfeited and the vested award will be subject to, to buyback, typically at fair market value or some lesser amount if it's a bad lever situation, things like that. But I, what I have seen on occasion is management teams try to negotiate for some sort of a tail almost on the buyback, where if a transaction occurs at a higher valuation within some period of time after the termination buyback date, that they'll get a, an adjustment upward on the repurchase price. I don't think that's as common, but I have seen that and requested and on occasions accepted by the sponsors. Again, I think it all depends on the circumstances of the particular deal. That's pretty interesting. I can't say I've seen that strategy employed. I think more often than not, where our clients are dealing with a good lever, somebody that's, that's being terminated without cause or they're resigning with good reason, they're agreeable to waiving the call right. They, they agree not to repurchase the equity. And that could be for a number of reasons, not just a good lever circumstance, but somebody that, that might be going to a, a customer or is otherwise going to be engaged with the management team or the business in some respect and want to do them a solid and let them keep their equity. Where it gets really interesting is at the sort of outset and the drafting of the governing documents, where it's a partnership agreement or a stockholders agreement and and drafting those call rights. And I've seen some management teams get really, really aggressive about what the buyback price is going to be. What is the fair market value determination? I, at least in my experience, more often than not, with a non-public company and the, the units are shared with no market, you leave it to the you leave it to the sponsor, as we're usually dealing with, let them determine in their good faith discretion what that market value is for purposes of the call rate and for other purposes as well. But and that gives sometimes, with or without good reason, somebody to sort of question that that approach and say, I would appreciate a little bit more certainty. And in the case of a call rate, we're going to ask you to go and solicit a third-party appraisal of the equity that's subject to the call rate. Have you seen that frequently at all? I've seen it. I've certainly seen it requested by management teams. I think there's oftentimes, I think to your point, there's oftentimes pushback on that from the sponsors because one is they don't want to have the headache of having to have that done whenever there's a, a buyback or the risk of it having been done. And then if they do, sometimes there's a debate or negotiation around what the cost is and who bears the cost of that, of that determination. I think I've seen it down to some places where if there's a dispute on the valuation, they go out and they get each of them gets their own valuator and they see whoever, you know, and and then they have a third party and they pick a third person. And then they, depending on how off that value was, determines who pays for the valuation. I mean, there's lots of different ways, I think, to do it. But I think more often than not, it's really just determined by the board in good faith. And that's what I've seen used. Yeah, it's one of those things. It gets incredibly complicated when you're trying to sort of figure out all these different avenues you can take in determining market value. And to your point, you know, sometimes it's 
I get my appraiser, you get yours. If my appraiser comes up with a value that's 10% or greater than yours, then you know I win. The alternative being I lose. If it's equal to or less than 10% of your appraisal, it's really interesting. And then in, then you get into the terms of the call itself. You know, how long after a manager or, or instead of equity holder leaves, should the company or the sponsor have the right to trigger the repurchase? Should that be six months? Should it be a year? Should it be more than that? I think more often than not, it's at or around a year. I haven't seen it be indefinite, except for one time. I did see an indefinite call right. They could pull the trigger at any time to repurchase management's equity, which I think is pretty unusual. The, um, and the other thing is, how do we pay you? Are we going to pay you with, with cash? Are we going to pay you with a note? What are the terms of the note? What's the duration of the promissory note? What is the interest rate? There's all these different items that go into the terms of the call rate. We could probably do another podcast on that. <laughs> You're right. I mean, it can certainly play in. And I think that I've even seen on some situations, I mean, I think the key often is, and I think the typical purpose behind not paying cash upfront is oftentimes the concern that there might be a, either a cash flow issue with the company, or more often, I think it's you know it's triggered by the concern that whatever the cash outlay would be might run afoul of the company's credit agreement. And so oftentimes, in the language that's in that provision says, to the extent that buying back at fair market value or buying back in cash would run afoul of whatever the limitations are under the credit facility, then we can pay you back in a note. So I think that's what I've what I've seen happen. I think one of the other things just to highlight, I think for people to be aware that, you know, I think how this all plays out also depends on the type of instrument you're using. And there's different things to be aware of, right? So if you're using a phantom equity, then unless you structure it as a, what I would say, a taxable note, like you really can't defer the payout arrangement, right? It's got to, and you also can't have a call right on the phantom equity. So you know, a lot of what we're talking about does depend on the type of instrument you're using each of which can have its own, you know, its own separate implications. Sure. It's probably a good point for our audience to be reminded to the extent you're responsible or involved with one of these repurchase arrangements, always check your credit agreement because to Josh's point, they often have pretty tight limits on what can be spent in terms of repurchasing equity from party management. So sometimes we get the call and it's too late. Oh, we already did the repurchase. That's good with our credit agreement, right? Well, <laughs> let's cross our fingers and let's check. Yeah. It's one of those things that, that often is overlooked and has some actual tangible implications. Another public service announcement, as it were, which might be a little bit off topic, but it's tied up in this, is that there's, you know, for purposes of thinking about forfeiture and whether or not you have to make an 83B election or even going into the golden parachute calculations when you have a deal that you have to do with what they call a determination of whether or not the payments are contingent on the transaction. You know, oftentimes you'll see people say, well, you know, I've got shares or profits and just, oh no, it's vested. It's fine. Like this is not subject to risk of forfeiture. I don't need to make an 83B or, you know, 280G is not applicable or whatever. But oftentimes there might be something buried in the, in the agreement like a repurchase right of less than fair market value in certain circumstances, which can actually be construed as itself a risk of forfeiture, making necessitating or, or maybe making appropriate an 83B election or figuring those amounts into 280G, even though you might think, well, it says it's a vested award or it's not subject to forfeiture. So again, all that can be interplayed within the repurchase rights within the documents, and it's important to keep those in, those arrangements in mind. Yeah, that's a great point. And I personally had that situation come up several times, and you know, it's never great when the you know opposing counsel is saying, "Are you sure these are vested?" Because we just saw this stockholders agreement that nobody knew about. And it has a call rate for less than market value. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. got to redo the 280G calculation. Yeah. And frankly, and to that point, even under 280G, and again, 280G can be its own separate podcast edition. When you run your analysis under 280G, you disregard whether or not an 83B election has been made. So, you know, you, people might mix that up and have an executive say, well, no, I made an 83B election four years ago. So it's 
vested for tax purposes, but no, for 280G calculation purposes, you treat it as if you didn't, as if there was no 83B election made, meaning that you still have to factor that amount in if it's vesting in the deal effectively, absent the 83B election. So I think that's probably a great place for us to end the discussion. We hope you found today's podcast episode helpful and it's a complex landscape, but understanding these aspects can make a significant difference in a lot of ways with the negotiations and the discussions around equity and other compensation in the context of a transaction. If you have any questions or need further clarification on any of the topics we talked about today, please don't hesitate to reach out to either of us directly. Uh, don't forget that we are hosting our annual webinar in September. We'll provide a comprehensive look at the future landscape of employee benefits and executive compensation. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much. Copyright Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders, LLP. These recorded materials are designed for educational purposes only. This podcast is not legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individual participants. Troutman Pepper does not make any representations or warranties, express or implied, regarding the contents of this podcast. Information on previous case results does not guarantee a similar future result. Users of this podcast may save and use the podcast only for personal or other non-commercial educational purposes. No other use, including, without limitation, reproduction, retransmission or editing of this podcast may be made without the prior written permission of Troutman Pepper. If you have any questions, please contact us at Troutman.com.